Hello, friends. Good evening once again. Yesterday, I could not complete the management of GDN. So today, I will be doing that. Thank you once again for logging into lecture series by me. As you know, I am Murli Pai, currently working as Dean at Sikkim Manipal Institute of Medical Sciences. Sikkim. So we'll straight away go to the management. Before that, let us recapitulate a little bit about the GTN. As you know, when you say gestational trophoblastic disease, everything is included, including the partial or complete pre-malignant hydratiform mole. But when you say GTN, only invasive mole, choriocarcinoma, placental site trophoblastic tumor, epithelioid trophoblastic tumor, and atypical placental site nodule are included. And they are malignant either locally or metastatically. So GTN occurs in molar pregnancy 50% of the time, though the percentages vary. The complete mole 15 to 20% choriocarcinoma, rest may be other types of malignancy. Partial mole, much lesser. Whereas it can occur even after an abortion or ectopic pregnancy in 25% of the cases, that is the tragedy. And much more shocking is GTN can occur even after a term pregnancy in 25% of the cases. That's where we are caught in a waste and it comes like a bolt from the blue. The clinical presentations are not very different from that of the complete or partial mole, and that is abnormal vaginal bleeding, which is leading symptom in most of the patients, more than 90%. Bleeding from metastatic sites is a newer symptom, and that can give rise to hemoptysis and other localizing symptoms, the pulmonary symptoms. There can be respiratory distress as well because of the lung metastasis. The neurological signs from spine and brain metastasis are also very distressing, and they will point towards the malignant variety of the gestational trophoblastic tumors. The GTN should be considered in patients with unusual presentations and serum HCG. Sometimes they may not have any particular symptom pointing towards pulmonary or brain metastasis, but there may be unusual symptoms. So, you have to do a serum beta HCG, and if it is elevated, always suspect. The FIGO criteria, when the plateau of HCG lasts for four measurements over a period of three weeks or longer, that is when you are following up the beta HCG after a molar evacuation, earlier we used to call it persistent trophoblastic disease, now we can straight away say it is going towards gestational trophoblastic neoplasia. If the HCG plateaus for four measurements, that is, let's say today's measurement, then the next three measurements, all the four measurements are same or plateauing, then it is considered persistent trophoblastic disease or GTN. Something like this. It came down, but then the next three weeks, it remains same. So totally four values remain same from today and next three values. I hope there's no confusion in this. And then other criteria is when there is a rise in HCG for three measurements over at least a period of two weeks or more, that is day one, seven and 14. Let's say today we get a value but next week it is rising, another week also it's rising. So totally three values we are looking at somewhat like this, that is also GTN. Or it could be increase in HCG at six months or more. That means after eight weeks it came down, it remains for another two months or four months, and then it starts rising, that is also GTN somewhat like this. It came down, but then it is rising again. 
after six months. So there are three criteria. I'll repeat plateauing of HCG for four measurements over a period of three weeks or longer, day one, seven, 14, 21, or when there's a rise in HCG for three measurements over at least a period of two weeks, that is day one, seven, 14, or after coming down six months later, it is increasing. All of them are considered GTN. If there is a histologic diagnosis of Correa carcinoma, obviously it is GTN, but I must tell you here, histologic diagnosis is not necessary. This is the only cancer where biopsy report is not necessary or histopathological report is not necessary to treat it. However, if you have sent the evacuated product for histopathology and if they tell that it is Correa carcinoma or if let's say it was uh, other innocent EB you did and then of course the histopathology comes as something like invasive mole or a, it is a placentocyte trophoplastic tumor or epithelial tumor, then you have to treat it like that. The diagnostic evaluation after you diagnose it as a case of GTM include, of course, HCG. It's common for all the five. Ultrasound, both pelvic and abdomen, to see the extent of it because we have to stage them. And if you suspect metastasis, if you suspect lung metastasis, which can occur in 80% of the cases, X-ray chest is a must. Sometimes lung CT also may be done. Even though lung metastasis is not considered very serious as far as the prognosis is concerned, but it is serious in terms of patient symptoms. Vaginal metastasis, which can occur in 20% of the cases, a simple speculum examination is more than enough, and you can see a subirthral nodule. The caution is do not attempt to remove it. It can bleed heavily and you will not be able to stop it at all. It will regress automatically after chemotherapy. Liver metastasis, metastasis can occur in 10% of the cases. A CT abdomen or an NLFT should be done. Brain metastasis, again, 10% of the cases, you have to do CT and MRI brain. Of course, when the patient is on chemotherapy, before chemotherapy, it is mandatory to do CBC and RFT because there can be side effects and you have to tailor the chemotherapy accordingly. The prognosis depends not only on the anatomic extent, but also on other factors. That's exactly why GTN is slightly different from other malignancies. Age matters, antecedent pregnancy, and the interval from that matters. For example, if the antecedent pregnancy was vesicular mole, then the prognosis is slightly better for the simple reason that you have been following it up and you will catch it very early. But if the antecedent pregnancy was a normal delivery, after which you usually never suspect any cancer, and suddenly it occurs, you are caught unawares at a time when it has already metastasized. So obviously the prognosis will be poor. Serum HCG value is very, very important at the time of diagnosis of a vesicular mole. If it was very high, such patients are likely to have poor prognosis. And when they develop GTN, if the HCG values are very, very high, they will come down very slowly after chemotherapy. Number, site, and size of metastasis is important like in any other cancer. Especially I here, I mentioned already about the site. Lung metastasis is not so serious compared to liver and brain metastasis. Of course, the size and number will always determine the prognosis. Prior chemotherapy, if somebody has been resistant to chemotherapy or failure to chemotherapy, such patients will have poor prognosis. So these factors have been considered to do what is called risk scoring. When I was in Charing Cross Hospital, London, the famous scoring was Backshaw scoring. That was later adopted by WHO and revised. And now what we have is the WHO revised scoring system. But then came the staging. If it is a cancer, it has to be staged. But what they did intelligently was they said, as far as GTN is concerned, both staging and risk scoring is important. 
I will talk about that in detail a little later. As I said, the first classification was done in 1967 by UICC. That's the one which gave me the fellowship. Backshot scoring, risk scoring came in 1976 and figure staging came in 82. Later it was revised. WHO took backshot scoring and modified it and made it as its own in 1983. Then came the combined FIGO staging and WHO scoring system in 2002, and that is holding today. What is this FIGO staging? A very simple, the common formula for any staging is stage one is local, stage two is in and around, stage three goes little outside, and stage four is distant. Similarly, here, stage one is localized to uterus. Stage two is in and around, that is pelvis and adnexa. Stage three is pulmonary, but not very serious. That's why it is stage three, though it is far away from uterus. But stage four is really distant. That is liver, brain, kidney, GI tract, and spleen. Very simple staging. But... The scoring system is little elaborate, not at all difficult though. As I said, it involves those risk factors which I showed the slide before this. Age matters, less than 40, zero marks, more than 41. Antecedent pregnancy, molar pregnancy, as I said, we are aware or we are anticipating choriocarcinoma, so zero marks. But if it occurs after abortion, one mark occurs after term delivery, two marks. Interval months from index pregnancy, less than four months is zero, four to seven months is one, seven to 13 months far away is two. And after one year of pregnancy, when you don't ever, ever think of choriocarcinoma, and if it occurs, marks given is four. Pre-treatment HCG, as I told you, higher the HCG, more is the marks. Larger tumor size, larger the size, more marks. Site of metastasis, lung gets zero. This is what I've been telling. This is the third time I'm telling. Spleen and kidney one, GIT two, liver and brain is four marks. Very, very important. Number of meds, more the meds, more than eight is four and others accordingly. Previous failed chemotherapy, single drug failure, two marks. Multiple drug failure, four marks. So together, when you add up all of them, it is called low risk if the total score is less than six and high risk if the score is equal to or more than seven. As I was telling yesterday, there is nothing like moderate risk here. I asked this question to Bakshaw and he said, the moderate risk is to be treated like a low risk only. If you think that it is not responding properly, then you can add some of the drugs of high risk. Combined figure staging and scoring, I'll give a couple of examples. How to know that it is low stage and low risk. Here is a case, 42-year-old lady, two months post-evacuation, ultrasound shows free adnexa, only it is in the uterus. HCG is 10,000, no metastasis. So age 42, she gets one mark. Antecedent pregnancy, molar, zero marks. Interval is actually two months, so zero marks. Pre-treatment HCG, 10,000, so one mark. Largest tumor size is less than three centimeters, so zero marks. Number of meds, no meds, zero marks. That is nil again, zero. And previous failed chemotherapy, no chemotherapy was given, so zero. So only this patient scores here one mark and here one mark, so two marks, less than six. And only uterus is involved. So finally, it is stage one because only uterus is involved, low stage, and only two marks, low risk. I'll give another example of high stage and high score. 41 year old lady, seven months post delivery. Mass of four centimeters, HCG, 100,000, and two liver meds. Let's see how to score this. 41 years, one mark, antecedent pregnancy was actually a normal delivery, term delivery, two marks. Seven months from that, two marks again. Mass of 
uh, let the HCG is 100,000, four marks, and mass of four centimeters, one mark. Site of metastasis is liver, four marks. Number of meds, two, one mark. Previous failed chemotherapy, none. So if you total it up, here we get one mark. One plus two is three. Three plus two is five. Five plus four is nine. Nine plus one is 10. 10 plus four is 14. 14 plus one is 15. So total marks is 15 and liver meds is there. So it is stage four and it is already high risk. In fact, very high risk, 15. I'll talk about very high risk a little later. So now I come to the treatment where actually I stay stopped. I thought it is better to recapitulate. I spent some 15 minutes on recapitulation, doesn't matter. I have enough time to talk about treatment. Stage one, two, and three, they are considered lower stages because three is lung metastasis, not very serious. Among that, again, if it is low risk, single agent chemotherapy is good enough. But if it is high risk, depending upon her other factors like age, beta HCG, number of uh, meds, and the previous antecedent pregnancy, etc. If you consider it is more than seven, then combination chemotherapy is required, even though the stage is low. This is the difference. This is the beauty. Staging is important. Risk score is also important. Even though the stage is less, if the risk is high, the combination chemotherapy is to be given. I hope it's very clear. Whereas stage four, usually means high risk because automatically you get four marks from the liver meds and HCG will be also very high in such situations. So four to four, eight, automatically they become high risk. So there's no question of low risk in stage four. So only combination chemotherapy is required. Then. Now I come to the single agent chemotherapy. The most popular drug has been for years to years is methotrexate plus folinic acid. Folinic acid is actually not an anti-cancer drug. It's a rescue drug. Actinomycin D, 0 0.5 milligrams intravenously for five days every two weeks, also is a single agent chemotherapy. The other single agents could be given are etoposide when she is resistant to methotrexate or actinomycin D. And the other one is 5-fluorouracil. If there is inadequate response, you can choose the alternative agents, like if she is not responding to methotrexate, switch over to actinomycin, not responding to that, go for etoposide or 5-fluorouracil as a single agent. Recently, the Cochrane review said that actinomycin D appears to be superior to methotrexate, but we are still happy with methotrexate because it's been there for a long, long time, time-tested drug. So I would go with methotrexate folinic acid as my first choice. I will tell the regime now. It's very, very simple to remember. They have made it so easy in uh, Charing Cross Hospital London. They call it one week on, one week off therapy. Or another simple uh, understanding they have made is called Monday to Monday therapy. You will soon realize what is this Monday to Monday therapy. So let's say today is Monday. We admit the patient and Day one, we give methotrexate, one milligram per kg IM. Day two, folinic acid, which is rescue. Day three, methotrexate. Day four, folinic acid. Day five, metho. Day six, folinic. Day seven, metho. And day eight is folinic acid. So you have come from Monday to Monday. So this one week is on. And next week, no chemotherapy. Off. Again, you call the patient on third Monday. I hope I'm clear. Very easy. Very, very easy to remember. In fact, they admit the, they used to admit the patient for three weeks at a time because today is Monday. We start the chemotherapy. We land up in the next week. So next week, no chemotherapy. But that particular week when you started, there can be sometimes bleeding up because of the crumpling of the cancer. And then you start the second course on the third Monday. After that only, if the patient is fine, they would discharge. The fourth week is anyway the off week. So all odd weeks, there is chemotherapy. 
I will come, I will tell you a little later together with the combined liver therapy, how long you give this. So methotrexate versus actinomycin, as I said, actinomycin seems to be more effective than methotrexate in the treatment of stage one low risk GTN, according to Cochrane. Actinomycin D can have side effects like mucositis and alopecia. Methotrexate has elevations of liver enzymes and they have got a lot of dehydration. So they used to keep big bottles of water next to them and they had to drink a lot of water. What is poor response? If HCG level plateaus above normal during treatment or if there is inadequate response to initial single agent, then you consider multiple agent chemotherapy. So I repeat, poor response means it comes down, but then it plateaus. Or if there is inadequate response, zigzag appearance, then you consider multiple agency agents, even though original score was low risk. I hope I'm clear. Then there is a borderline always, five to six score. It is low score, but it's at the border, five to six. A score five to six and clinical pathologic diagnosis of chorecarcinoma are associated with increased risk of resistance to single agent chemotherapy. That's what in the previous slide, poor responders, what we meant. Maybe these are belonging to what is called moderate risk. They have not put a moderate risk category there, but maybe these are the ones. So you can lower the threshold to use the multiple agent in such patients. Right. So what is combination chemotherapy now? For high-risk patients, we have to give combination therapy, and the most famous regime is IMACO. That is etoposide, methotrexate, actinomycin D, cyclophosphamide, and oncomine or vincristine. For refractory cases, you can give EPEMA. EMA is always there. Etoposide is always there. Now you can consider, instead of cyclophosphamide, and on COVID, you can consider cisplatin. Cisplatin is a very powerful chemotherapy. We all know about it, what we use in ovarian malignancies. So what is the EMACO regime? The methotrexate regime was one week on, one week off. This is another simple way they have made. What is that? One week EMA, one week CO. It is like this. So Monday, you start again, you give EMA. So 100 milligrams per meter square, IV infusion over 30 minutes, methotrexate the same way, 100 milligrams per meter square bolus IV or 200 micro milligrams per meter square IV infusion over 30 minutes, and then active in D, 330 micrograms per meter square IV bolus. Next day, you give only etoposide, actinomycin, methotrexate whenever you give, next day you have to give folinic acid. That's it about this week. Next week, you give CO, that is cyclophosphamide and oncovin, 600 milligrams per meter square IV infusion, oncovin one milligram per meter square IV bolus. Again, you repeat that. The third Monday, you give EMA. Fourth Monday, you give CO. Whenever you give methotrexate, of course, the next day, Tuesday, you have to give folinic acid along with etoposide and actinomycin. I hope it is clear. One week EMA, one week CO. One week EMA, one week CO. There's no off here. What is ultra high risk? Remember, in the second example, which I gave you, the score became 15. That is ultra high risk. I told you that time. Any score more than 13 is ultra high risk. Obviously, it will have brain and liver meds, and there may be multiple set. Mets also GI tract, kidney, lungs everywhere. And they will respond very poorly to IMACO. So what is the chemotherapy to be given for ultra high risk? For those with massive disease, starting with standard chemotherapy may cause sudden tumor collapse with severe bleeding. So what you must do, start gently. Initial gentle rather than full dose chemotherapy seems better for them. You can induce actually with EP, that is etoposide, with cisplatin. Cisplatin is our favorite chemotherapeutic agent in gynecology as such. We are very well versed with that in ovarian malignancy, as I said earlier. It is repeated weekly for one to three weeks before you go for that usual normal chemotherapy of IMACO. I hope I'm clear this. You induce with EP for one to three weeks 
and then you go for Imaco. Even there, you start with the gentle doses and then go for full dose. Then there's something called salvage therapy. It is beyond, let's say, the patient has gone to a very bad stage and it is more than 15 or there are a lot of problems and you don't know what to do. You can go for EPEMA. You remember what I said earlier. It is etoposide. Etoposide has to be there for all uh, GTN. Cisplatin, methotrexate is again favorite. Actinomycin B is also again favorite. So EPEMA, one week EP, another week EMA. Then there is something called TPT. Paclitoxal also is our favorite drug in ovarian malignancy. So you go for paclitoxal, cisplatin, and paclitoxal and etoposide. You can't get away with etoposide. You have to have etoposide. BEP. BEP is a favorite regime in our uh, germ cell tumors that we use. Bleomycin. Again, our favorite etoposide is there. Cisplatinum is there. So BEP regime also is used, or you can use BEM instead of cisplatin, our favorite methotrexate. Methotrexate will melt the GTN like anything. So that's why BEP or BEM. So these are all our favorite drugs. There's nothing much to worry and remember. Methotrexate, actinomycin D, Imaco, EPEMA, TPT or BP, BEP or BEM. Very simple. High dose chemotherapy with autologous bone marrow or stem cell transplant also have been tried. Immunotherapy with pembrolizumab is used for salvage therapy. Then for cerebral meds, abnormal CSF HCG level is interpreted as one where the ratio with serum HCG is more than one is to 60. So very high CSF HCG. So an increase in methotrexate infusion can be tried one milligrams per meter square will help the drug cross blood brain barrier. Or you can consider intrathecal methotrexate or a combination chemotherapy with concurrent whole brain irradiation. For the first time, we are talking about irradiation. Otherwise, GTN is a success story with chemotherapy. This is one of the very few cancer, one or two, three cancers we talk about cure rates. All other cancer we talk about control of cancer. So GTN was the probably first successful chemotherapy story where chemotherapy totally gets rid of the cancer. But if there is a brain mats, we have to give irradiation. Monitoring during chemotherapy, response to drugs is monitored always by HCG regression curve. Even the follow-up is always by HCG regression curve. Toxicity is uh, monitored, of course, like in any other cancer chemotherapies, CBP, RFT, LFT before each course. Courses. Now, this is the important issue. We have to understand this very, very carefully. How many courses to be given? In ovarian cancer, we say six courses. In other cancers, we say three courses or four courses. But here, we don't number the courses. Then how many courses? Chemotherapy is continued until remission. Now, what is remission? Three consecutive weekly normal HCG titers. But that's not all. What is advised is in low risk patient, at least one course beyond remission. It's not just till remission. You have to give one more course beyond remission. And in high risk, three further courses beyond remission. Now, why is this? This is because there will be microscopic, uh, uh, you know, uh, trophoblastic cells or places which can still lurk and they can cause problems later on. So that's why one extra course after remission and three extra courses after remission, not just till remission. Postponement of chemotherapy can be considered if there is severe toxicity, but then you have to restart and you have to do the beta HCG regression. Follow-up after chemotherapy, stage one to three, weekly serum beta HCG until three normal values like the previous one. Monthly serum beta HCG until normal values for 12 months. In stage four, first year, weekly till three months, same thing. Then two weekly up to six months, two weekly urine HCG up to seven to 12 months. Second year, monthly. Third year, two monthly. Fourth year, three monthly. Fifth year, four monthly sixth year, six monthly, and then of course, lifelong. 
It's not very difficult. All it means is you have to do more often. What are the cure rates? As I told you, this is the success story in the history of allopathic medicine. Non-metastatic cases, 100% cure rates. Even in metastatic and low-risk cases, 100% cure rates, not control rates. Metastatic high-risk patients, 70 to 95%, not bad at all. Relapse risk. What is this relapse risk? Relapse usually occurs in first year itself. That's why we have to be very careful. Very close monitoring is always done in first year. You remember that. Weekly up to, let's say, three, till three normal levels and then two weekly and then monthly. All that is because in the first year, relapse is very high. Does not occur after three years. That's why after three years, you go down to once in four months, once in five months, once in six months, in the fifth, sixth years. 5% is the relapse rate for high risk, 3% for the low risk. Treatment is salvage therapy. You know what is salvage therapy. As I told you, EP, EMA, or BEP, BEM, or PT slash PE. Late sequel of chemotherapy, small but significant increase in secondary tumors like AML, colonic cancer, breast cancer. This is due to chemotherapy. We have to be careful about it. Early onset menopause, maybe because the ovaries are destroyed. What is the fertility outcome, however, in the younger patients? No adverse pregnancy outcomes. In subsequent pregnancy, however, we have to do early ultrasound to rule out a repeat, uh, just a vesicular mole, but the repetition is very less, less than 2%. Placenta or products of conception may be sent for histopathology. Serum HCG levels at six weeks after completion of pregnancy because we want to see whether it is showing any rising trends. What is the role of surgery? In primary role is to control complications. Hysterectomy for uncontrolled uterine bleeding. I have yesterday explained this. You don't, hysterectomy is not the first line treatment, but if there is a complication, bleeding, perforation, rupture, laceration, we have to do it. Laparotomy to stop the bleeding from liver, GI, kidney, and spleen. Most often it is done in cases of PSTT or ETT. Secondary role is in drug-resistant diseases as a part of salvage treatment or extirpation of isolated meds. Role of radiotherapy has already been told. It's only for the brain metastasis. Now a short note on two slides on PSTT, that is placental site trophoblastic tumor and ETT, epithelial tumor. They are actually very rare, but occurs years after index pregnancy. That's the tragedy. Often seen in postmenopausal women also. We have to keep this in mind along with endometrial cancer and other things. Often limited to uterus, confused always with endometrial cancer. It represents neoplastic transformation of intermediate trophoblastic cells. And HCG is not a marker. Please note, HCG is not a marker. It may be a little bit elevated, but only if the pathologist has this in mind, will she or he give us the diagnosis. Low levels of HCGs. And then we have nonetheless a rise or plateau of serum HCG is still a marker for refractory or relapsed disease and serum urine HCG are monitored as a follow-up. HPL is raised, you can estimate that. So the primary treatment is surgery because it does not respond to chemotherapy, hysterectomy or resection of meds can be done. It's a chemo resistant disease. So in advanced cases, maybe you can consider EPEMA or TETP used. Contraception, barrier is better. OCPs pills do not delay the HCG. It can be given now. EMPA is also used. IUCD used only when HCG is returned to normal. Quiescent HCG syndrome, low levels of HCG will lurk usually in double digits, does not require any treatment, as most would regress over time, needs just fall up as 7% may progress. There's something called phantom HCG also. Heterophil antibodies that will show three-digit HCG, negative urine test for HCG will show different values with different techniques. Nothing to do. To summarize what is said so far, the gestational trophoblastic is common in East and extreme of ages. It is androgenesis as the pathogenesis. That means complete mole, all paternal chromosomes in partial mole, triploidy, maternal, as well as paternal. Early diagnosis by ultrasound is an important issue. 
immediate evacuation followed by CG has to be done up to 20% canton malignant, more so in complete mole. GTN is suspected when there is plateauing or increase or rise after six months. Combined FIGO staging and risk scoring is important. Low risk is less than six, high risk is more than seven. It is highly chemosensitive with 100% cure rates in low risk for low risk single agent for high risk multiple agent. Imaco is the most favorite drug in combination chemotherapy, whereas methotrexate is most favorite. You have to give one extra dose course after remission in low risk, three extra courses in high risk. PSTT, ETT is our chemo resistant, so surgery is a must. Radiotherapy is only for brain meds and hysterectomy only for complications in elderly. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed these two lectures on GTD and GTN. See you tomorrow with another topic. And you may message me what are the topics you want.